This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Bagman. A law, by its very definition, implies restrictions. But that's not the case with one new law. We say new, although it's been around for many years. But now we take a new look at it. The Harvest Information Program. We go inside outdoors with Kentucky's waterfowl coordinator to better understand these transient birds and how a quick survey could increase the bag limit for every sportsman and woman. It's next on Kentucky Afield Radio. By the time you're 20, you have a good knowledge of the course you're taking in life. I'm glad I do. This year, Kentucky Nature License Plates turn 20 as well. These are plates with the Bobcat, Cardinal, and the Butterfly. Kentucky Nature License Plates have helped safeguard more than 80,000 acres of wilderness areas for everyone to appreciate. And I can't wait to see what's down the road. See you with me. Next time you renew, choose a nature plate and drive home your support for the great outdoors. There's one thing better than being the captain of a ship, and that is being the captain of a canoe. They take you places barely found on a map. Still, there's something dire in their wake. Nationally, canoes account for nearly twice the boating fatalities as personal watercraft. The same is true for kayaks. So if you take your solitude seriously, Captain, take along a life jacket. Your life jacket's got your back. A message from your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. This is Charlie Baglin on Kentucky Field Radio, my home address for the next hour. Christmas. In September, every sportsman or woman, every sports kid, looks forward to September. It includes dove season, deer archery season, archery season for turkey, duck, goose seasons open, and scattered other seasons throughout the month, including elk. Half of the opening days in September fall under the domain of migratory birds. There's a new law that will apply to you if you hunt rails, mallards, wood duck, and other migratory birds that will list along the way through the program. My guest is a man who has been on the show a few times in the past, but never in this context. We welcome Dr. John Brunges. And John, what is the new title? I am the Migratory Bird Program Coordinator. Migratory birds. There are a lot of migratory birds out there. There certainly are. In our agency, that program is defined as dealing with migratory game birds, and we also work with non-game wetland-oriented migratory birds. So non-game other upland birds like hawks and owls and things are found in our diversity program. But So we deal with ducks and geese and, and game birds like uh, doves and rails and woodcock, and then we also deal with non-game birds that are, again, wetland-oriented, like herons and egrets and, and terns and things like that. Lots of birds like to migrate neotropical migratory songbirds. Absolutely. We, I mean, in Kentucky, there's only a couple of species of birds that aren't migratory. There's only three species. Really? What are those? Quail grouse and turkeys. Every other bird is classified by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a migratory bird. You think about, well, my cardinal's in my yard all the time, but they're actually, cardinals do migrate. Well, I'm thinking a robin. I'm thinking of the birds we see in winter. Right. Robin. That, I assume, are resident. We go, robin go to Florida and, and parts of Florida. There'll be tens, if not hundreds of thousands of robins in a flock. Uh, the birds you have in your yard in, in winter may not be the same birds that are in your yard in summer. Hmm. We may have Michigan robins in Kentucky in the wintertime, and our robins may be in south. It may be that some of them stick around as well, but uh, I guess the legal definition of migratory bird means that some portion of the the flock migrates and moves. A resident goose, a resident eagle, are they still, even though they're resident, still eagles are classified as migratory? They are, and the geese especially. You know, the, everybody likes to call the geese out here that we see out here in our city parks and stuff. We call them resident birds. They never leave here. They never go anywhere. Though that's not entirely true. The geese that we banned, uh, some portion of the year-old birds, so birds we banded last summer, will go on what we call molt migration, and they will take off from here in Kentucky, and the ones in central Kentucky will 
will go sometime in early to mid-May, and they'll take off, and they'll head to the shore of James Bay, and they'll end up on the Gamaskee Island in James Bay or on the uh, on the western shores of James Bay, and uh, will spend the summer there while they molt their feathers. Where is James Bay? Uh, I guess very northern uh, Ontario, right on the shore of Hudson and James Bay. They'll go up there, and the birds from, like, Paducah or out west actually go all the way farther up the shore of Hudson Bay, up past Churchill, up uh, quite a bit farther west and north. And you know this because of goose banding. Absolutely. So those birds do make a migration. Now then, after that, they come back to Kentucky, and they'll spend most of their life here in Kentucky. Uh, but, you know, on a really cold winter, they'll make some movement south. We uh, Last year, some of our birds we banded here in Kentucky were killed a little bit farther south than, say, Tennessee or uh, northern Alabama or somewhere like that. I know you've had, over the years, a mission of protection of leased turns. One of the troubles with getting a new job or getting a promotion is you have to leave the old job behind to start doing the work of the new job. How much of the lease turn business, what does that mean, and are you still at all involved? Well, lease terns are the only endangered, the federally listed as endangered species of birds that nest in Kentucky. They're a small seabird that actually nests on the islands in the Mississippi River and Ohio Rivers out in far western Kentucky. And they've been on the decline for years because basically the the rivers have changed over time. There used to be lots of sandbars in the river and we've done things like build dams and we've, uh, you know, created flood control structures and things like that that more channelize the river and less allow these islands to be created. So the islands that we do have now are out there in the river. They look like a great place for boaters to pull up. And so we've had a lot of disturbance, a lot of trouble with the turns over the years. So my mission kind of got getting here was see if I could help out. And we've been posting the islands and monitoring the birds for all these years. And uh, we've had last year was one of our best, most successful years ever. The birds really did well. They produced a lot of chicks last year. This year it was complete failure. We uh, the islands have been underwater all summer with flooding, so they, there was no success this summer. But that's kind of built into their system. They live a long time, and they only need to be successful every so often. So our goal was on those good years like last year, we allow them to be successful. So yes, with the new job, I will be a little bit out of the out of that. I was in the field a couple days a week all summer. Uh, now I will have to kind of re- turn that over to whoever fills. My my old position and to some of the technicians who get the the hard job of uh, spending the summer walking on the beach all day out on the river. Keeping the motorcycles away, keeping the boaters away, hikers, walkers, and people who just don't mean any harm. But the signs are there. What do those signs say? The, the signs say, uh, they tell people that it's an endangered least turn nesting area, please keep out. And you're right, people don't intend to go out there and cause trouble, but the si- this bird is the size of a sparrow. It's a little tiny white bird, and it lays its eggs in the sand. There's no sticks, no nest, no nothing. It's just depression in the sand, and the eggs are probably about the size of a dime. So anybody who's not trained to look for this nest can step on it so easy, and people don't don't, you know, people don't intend to, but again, it's important if you run into a big yellow sign that has birds on it that says keep out that you that you obey that sign. Not everybody knows the name Rocky Pritchard, although they have certainly heard of his name somewhere. If you like to hunt waterfowl and mallard ducks and wood duck, Rocky Pritchard, I'm going to say 25, maybe 30 years with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, was in charge of, well, he was the goose guy, the goose and duck man. And now that's you. Along with any change in in leadership, there's going to be some change in the programs. What do you bring to it? What do you want to add to it or concentrate on that maybe hasn't been done in the last few decades? Rocky certainly did a great job with the program and spent years, uh, years and years here. I think, it, like you said, about 25 years, 26 years here. Uh, he he did a lot of things. Uh, those of you who like to hunt wood ducks in September can thank him for that. He was one of the folks who got in there and battled for for that opportunity. To, to this day, the fish 
Fish and Wildlife Service still isn't really that happy about us in Tennessee and Florida having that season, but uh, he was a big part of it in us having it. Uh, he was a big part in the opportunity eventually down the road to have a Santo Crane hunting season, and uh, again, a big part of us having last year we started having a teal season uh, four additional days on the end of our wood duck and teal season, and without him battling for it, it probably wouldn't have happened. So uh, I think he's did a lot of great things for the agency. Uh, I worked for him for nine years, I guess, and uh, learned a lot. And so, uh, you know, we'll have minor differences in how we do things. But mostly for now, I've been hanging on trying to figure out all the things that he did. And uh, he did lots of stuff that I never knew about. So it's for, for me, it's learning, kind of figuring out all the things that have to be done and uh, trying to make sure that I don't mess up too much in my first couple months. Dr. John Brunges, Kentucky's wildlife biologist in charge of migratory game birds. He's my guest, and he'll be back right after the break. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. We're back on Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and dove season opens September 1st. The man in charge of that and other hunting seasons as they apply to migratory birds. These are birds like geese, and ducks, and reels, is Dr. John Brunges. We opened the show, John, and you said that all birds in Kentucky migrate, with the exception of three, quail, wild turkey, and rough grouse. So all other birds are what, just visitors here or what? Well, I guess it depends on the species of waterfowl you're talking about. If you're talking about a wood duck, they come here for their nesting, and this is where they spend their summers and a big, big part of their life, and eventually they'll go farther south in the wintertime, and maybe we'll pick up a few northern birds in the winter. So, again, it all depends on the species. The mallards, you know, you eat some of those mid-continent mallards end up here in Kentucky for a month of January and February, something like that. But uh, managing migratory birds is a really complex issue, and, and we don't do it just as Kentucky. Kentucky is part of the Mississippi Flyway Council. Uh, it's a, a group of 14 states uh, clustered basically east and west of the Mississippi River. We work with those states, and I guess there are also three provinces that we work with to manage these species because they're a shared resource. What happens in Wisconsin impacts Kentucky. What happens in Kentucky impacts Tennessee or uh, Louisiana. Again, uh, our wood ducks we banned outside of Kentucky, the biggest location where they're harvested in Louisiana. So what we do in Kentucky impacts Louisiana and, and vice versa. So it's important for us to not just do things in our little vacuum here in Kentucky. And to that end, I spend a couple weeks a year at, at meetings at the Flyway Council and uh, it will, we'll work with other states and provinces to make sure that we're managing this resource properly. So that would be why Kentucky doesn't itself place a hunting season on geese and ducks. That's federally set. That's kind of correct. The, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has the ultimate authority to manage migratory birds, and that's given by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. The Fish and Wildlife Service originally, back in the way back days, each state, Kentucky would say, we want to do this, and Tennessee would say, we want to do that, and, and Michigan would say, we want to do this, and there was no c- coordination. And so everybody realized in the late 40s that just wasn't working. And so they got together and formed these flyway councils. And so what happens now is all of us states that share this resource get together, we discuss it, we look at the data, biological data on the birds, and then we make a recommendation to the Fish and Wildlife Service. So for this year, this coming duck hunting season, we've looked at the data. We're at an all-time high count of mallards. We're at an all-time high count of total ducks. So we have a couple of regulatory options, and that regulatory option that we recommended to the Fish and Wildlife Service was a liberal season, which is a 60-day long, six-bird season. And uh, so we made that recommendation to the service. The service just recently approved it, so we will have what we've been in, I guess, the last 18 years, a liberal season with a 60-day days and six birds a day. It's one thing to see geese flying over Henderson Sloughs or the Ballard Wildlife Refuge in western Kentucky. We don't think that much about the tundra in northern Canada, should we? 
And what shape is it in? In these, it depends on the species and where you're talking about. If we're talking about Canada geese, they are again the Canada geese that we get here in Kentucky come from. They're uh, in, we call them interior populations of Canada geese. They're uh, the Mississippi Valley population of Canada geese, which uh, nest on the shore of Hudson Bay, but maybe just west, I mean just east of Churchill, kind of close to the where uh, James Bay comes down, and then James Bay, uh, the southern James. Bay population, which is mostly on the Gamaski Island or on, on the shore of uh, James Bay, immediately adjacent to west of that. So those two populations come to Kentucky. Those used to be the massive groups that we had in Ballard County and parts west. But uh, we, we, a few of those birds make it this far south now, but those birds now actually come across the entire state of Kentucky. We, we have a significant chunk, probably the biggest chunk of those migrants now are killed uh, in around Lexington, around uh, Louisville, and those parts of the, here in the central part of the state. So we get lots of, so the tundra where they nest uh, is, is actually probably not quite, it's actually not really tundra yet. You're not that far north. Uh, but they, their habitats in general are good. But if we're talking about snow geese, which are high Arctic nesters, uh, the snow goose populations have, have increased and increased and in spite of a lot of efforts to try to kind of get a handle on uh, controlling the population. They, uh, you know, we originally thought there were nine or 10 million uh, snow geese, but it's probably more like 30 to 40 million snow geese and areas where they nest you can see on satellite images you can tell where they nest from satellite images because they've they've impacted the areas where they are so much how in the world can the habitat sustain them well, the, the, I guess the biggest answer, best answer to that is there's a whole lot of habitat up in the Arctic. There's a whole lot of, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for us to imagine how much open space there is up there. Uh, but it can't sustain where they are long term. They, they are, are, are damaging the spots where they are. But, you know, again, they're, they're little tiny dots on a world of a huge, vast landscape. So there's, you know, they can move to new places. And in the meantime, the old places can recover. Maybe, maybe not. We aren't sure because so many things happen. First of all, you know, here in Kentucky, you plow a field up and you leave bare dirt and you walk away, and a year later, it, you can't hardly tell that you plowed it. You've got vegetation growing, you've got grass growing, and you know, a hundred years from now, you'll have trees and it'll be back to, to back to mature forest. Uh, but there, the, it's such a tough environment that damage may never recover. It may never recover to the thing. They do things like the geese are, uh, snow geese are gr- uh, grubbers. They dig in the soil and pull roots out of plants. And so by doing that, they change uh, the soil chemistry. They, they uh, create erosion and uh, they impact the seed bank and things like that. So it may be those areas are never able to recover to what they were. So snow geese are the problems up there. And in certain in, in certain areas, yeah. Important then to be able to control those populations. I would trust there's ways to do that hunting among them. We, we've we tried hunting. We uh, th- A few years ago, we created what's called a snow goose conservation order season. Uh, in general, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act allows uh, basically the last you could have a hunting season is the end of February. Uh, but with snow geese, we had an amendment to that the act which allows hunting into march we allow hunting with with electronic calls we allow hunting with unplugged guns we allow basically almost anything uh for people to and there's no limits no nothing and so during regular goose seasons we shoot about eight nine hundred thousand uh, snow geese and we shoot another eight or nine hundred thousand uh during that conservation order season and so back when we thought we had nine million uh, you know one 1.8 million was having a pretty big, good, pretty good impact. We thought we we're on the right track, but we've uh, started banding geese up in the Arctic, and uh, we discovered that the very few of the birds we banned get shot. And so, based on some of the estimates now, on the banding estimates, we estimate populations that could be anywhere from 20 to 50 million. So there are a lot more geese than we originally thought. I've been to Ballard, and I have seen flocks of these fly through the sky, and it looks like by the thousands, if not the hundreds of thousands. They darken the sky beneath them. You've seen that. Mm -hmm. How does that compare to the flocks that would be in Canada? 
you know, the hundreds of thousands is a bit uh, is a bit much. We have uh, ten to twenty thousand in, at times in, in Western Kentucky, uh, for the most part, what our surveys show up. So we there are times where you can look up definitely see you know ten thousand snow geese up in there, and it seems like an unbelievable number. The bigger concentrations, there is a group uh, where you could be in uh, northern uh, Missouri, kind of northwestern Missouri, where there would be two hundred thousand snow geese at a time in the spot. And uh, if you think of western Kentucky Ballard is impressive. 200,000 is, is an almost insane number to see in one spot. Uh, there And again, farther farther west, the, most of the birds end up in Texas and places like that. So you can see some really, Louisiana, you see some really massive groups uh, in those areas too. Uh, but 200,000 birds in one spot is almost incomprehensible. It seems it's, it's unbelievable. In front of me, you can probably see where you're sitting. I have the Kentucky Field Calendar. In September, there are many opening days. Half of them belong to you. The most important one on September 1st. Yeah, doves. Absolutely. That's at least it, I say it's most important to me. I love I love dove hunting, and it's it's one of my favorite things. And there are probably more people in Kentucky other than deer that hunt doves than anything else. And so it's a it's a huge tradition, and uh, it's a it's an important day here in Kentucky. So you're saying deer still lead the pack, and then doves? The biggest chunk of our hunters deer are deer hunters, but among small game, doves are number one. So Canada Goose opens uh, September 1st, goes on. Common Moorhen going to be opening. Dove, uh, wood duck, teal. There's a lot of these. There's one thing we need to discuss before we discuss all of the various waterfowl seasons that are going to be opening, and that's the Harvest Information Program. We open the show talking about this quote-unquote new law and how laws, rules, regulations, by their very nature, sound restrictive, but not so much in this case. The Harvest Information Program is a survey, and it's helpful in determining the hunting pressure that is found on various game birds and how all that plays into the management of the overall population. All the details after the break and our fishing report. Stay with us. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. Baglin back on Kentucky Afield Radio. We would love for you to tell your friends about this show. If they like to dove hunt, email them the link to this show. You can find it three different places. At myhuntingandfishing.com. We are also on iTunes as a podcast. And go to YouTube. You'll find us there, too, every show we've had for years. Just put in the search box, Kentucky Afield Radio. Share the link on Facebook. We'll listen to the show again. As soon as we come back from our fishing report, we'll get into the meat of what we have been, or I have, been calling a new law. It's not really a new law. In fact, I think it's been around since 1995 or 96 or so. What's new is our approach to it. Details just ahead after our fishing report. Jeff Crosby with the Central District Fishing Report. District lake temperatures continue to run in the upper 70s to lower 80s. At Taylorsville Lake, channel and blue catfish continue to be caught using cut bait in 8 to 15 feet of water when fish near Old Creek or river channels. Also, this time of year, don't forget about your local streams and rivers in your area. It's a great time of year to canoe streams such as Elkhorn Creek, South Fork Laking, or Salt River for good catches with smallmouth and rock bass. Fish small crankbaits or jerk baits, as well as some small jigs to catch a few of these fish. And finally, don't forget about the Fishing in Neighborhoods program. Many of these lakes have been stocked with channel catfish and have good natural populations of bass and bluegill. So grab a pole and I hope to see you on the water. Hi, this is Eric Cummins with your Southwest Kentucky Fishing Report. Barren River Lake hybrids have been fair in the lower third of the lake, trolling the flats with some surface action early and late in the day. Bass have been fair early and late on top waters with night bite also fair with short arm spinner baits, jigs and tube jigs and plastic worms in 10 to 15 foot of water. 
water. Crappie have been fair under lights with some yellow and white bass showing in there as well. Green River Lake also is a summer pool with a thermocline depth in the 16 to 17 foot. Bass have been fair early and late on the top waters with best fishing at night with grubs and tubes in 12 to 16 foot of water. Cumberland River trout have been excellent with a variety of baits, spinners, small crankbaits, and wax worms. As always, good luck and good fishing. Be sure your life jacket's got your back. In western Kentucky, down at Kentucky and Barkley Lakes, we're in that summertime fishing pattern where it's just uh, need to be fishing early in the morning. Fishing is kind of slow during the day, but it is picking up in the evenings. What I like this time of the year is going back up in the embayments. All the shad minnows are back up there jumping around, and they've got a lot of small bass chasing them around. So I like to go up there and what I call slow roll a spinner bait, where you're just dragging that spinner braid across the surface and getting the attention of those largemouth bass. And they're not big fish, but there's a lot of them up there. In the tailwater, striped bass, also a good thing to be fishing for this year, along with the blue cats and live baits. Skipjack herring is the bait of choice down there for those stripers right now. Well, this is Paul Reister, and I hope you find a good day to go fishing. Talking this hour about the Harvest Information Program. More after the break. I sail home on peaceful water. Kentucky has some troubled waters. Sailing in a sewer all the way. Boaters dumping waste overboard when no one's looking ruins the day for everyone, fish included. So use an approved dump station. Sailing in a sewer all the day. Dilution is not the solution. Use your holding tank wisely or hold it in. A message from your Kentucky wildlife and boating officers. Kentucky Field Radio, Charlie Bagman back along with my guest, John Brunges. He is in the studio, and we are discussing the upcoming waterfowl seasons and dove seasons and how for managers like John to do an effective job, they need to know all the players and all the parts of the game. You ask me how many dove hunters we have. And the difficulty in that is I can tell you I really don't know. It's difficult because we need that information. We need to know. And so at the Harvest Inventory Program was a program developed by the states and by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that it basically allows states to identify who are migratory bird hunters. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will survey those hunters to see, and it gives us an idea how many hunters there are out there and how many birds those hunters are killing and what those hunters are hunting. And so the problem is that any of you that bought a license, uh, you know that you go went to your vendor and purchased a license, and you may or may not have gotten asked questions. Did you hunt doves last year? Did you hunt ducks last year? A lot of times those questions took up extra time, and in a busy time when there's a line of people, people wouldn't ask them. And so a lot of times those questions weren't asked. And so there was this huge group of people that the Fish and Wildlife Service had to kind of search through to try to find who was a migratory bird hunter and who wasn't. And so we ended up with some really poor quality data here in Kentucky. And so, again, it's important to know because we use that information. Again, when I go to argue, hey, we want to do this, and we spend money on uh, cooperative dove fields, and we basically pay private landowners to create places for the public to hunt. And so it's important for me to know how many dove hunters I have so that I can say, hey, this is important. We need to keep funding this. Uh, it's also that that data is used in harvest management models. Now, Dove model incorporates how many doves are harvested across the country. The canvasback model, if any of y'all hunt canvasbacks, you know that we, hunt, we jump from one bird to two bird bag to one bird bag to round. A lot of that is because of the uncertainty uh, associated with the hip number. So it's important information. It's important for us to know how many people are hunting and how many people are harvesting birds. We're using three different terms to describe this survey, HIP, H-I-P, I said harvest information. You said harvest inventory. Is there an official? HIP is the easiest thing to do. You're right. It is harvest information program. There was a period where they had the name changed, and uh, I still live on the old day. So it's harvest information program. The survey needs to be taken, as I understand it, so that you are 
uh, allowed to buy the license. Right. It's a federal regulation that you have to have taken this hip survey before you can hunt migratory birds. Where do you take it? How do you do it? Okay. So what? We, again, our, in the past we did it when you purchased the license. So and this again, could be at Kmart, Walmart, at Kmart, the, Walmart, wherever. If you bought it online, you could do it all then. Okay. So again, the data was just not was not working, and so this uh, last year we worked with our commission, and the commission approved a change in that process. And so now, before you hunt migratory birds, you have to go online, go to our website, fwky.gov, and on there, there is a little link to what's called My Profile. And My Profile is an amazing thing they've just kind of created in the last year, and it's going to be your one-stop shop for all your information you need to know in the future. And when you log on to My Profile, there it shows you all the animals that you've ever telechecked, that shows results. So uh, if you put in for a quota hunt, something like that, it'll show you how many preference points you have. It'll give you all that information. And right over on the right-hand side, there's a little red box that says, hey, if you plan to hunt migratory birds, click here. If you click on that box, it walks you through a series of questions. The whole process takes less than five minutes. In fact, the, the logging on to my profile and the drop-down menu when you're as old as I am, you're starting to go back to into the, that far back on the thing, takes you longer to log on than it does to answer the questions and get through. So you have to do this. So it's not done now at the Sporting Goods Shop. It's not done at Sporting Goods Shop because, again, it just wasn't being done. All right, walk me through the process. Charlie Baglin wants to go Let me pick something out here. You want Hunt Virginia Rail, All right. or Sora Rail, All right. on uh, the second day of September. Okay. All right, so in order to be legal. you got to buy your hunting license first. All right. So you've got your hunting license. You also have to have the migratory bird slash waterfowl stamp. Is hunting. that state or federal? It's a state, state stamp. All right. Uh, so you have to have those two permits to hunt migratory birds. You do not have to have a federal duck stamp to hunt rails. If you're going to hunt ducks or geese, you would. But just for rails, doves, uh, woodcock, things like that, you do not have to have the duck stamp. So you have to have a hunting license and Kentucky's uh, migratory bird hunting permit. Okay, and, and then it could have easily said ducks or geese. And so I need the federal stamp. If you hunt ducks or geese. Now, at what point do I take this survey? Okay, so now you own your license. If you purchased your license online through our department's website, immediately at the completion of purchasing, it gives you the link to go to do the survey right then. Okay, so if the, you don't have to do that first. No, you do it after you buy your license. After well, you, well, can I just skip it? You can skip it. If you, you can, yeah, if you buy your license and you buy, say you buy a sportsman's license and you have no intention of hunting migratory birds, then you don't have to do the survey. But if you skip it, again, you are required before you go in the field to have taken this survey. So if you don't have it, then you are subject to have be breaking the rules. So if a conservation officer were to check your license and permits, you he will be or she will be looking for this number. Right. And what would happen again, say if you bought it online, you do it immediately. If you bought it at Walmart and you get home that evening, you log on to my profile, you click the box that says uh, you need to take your hip survey and in there it will, because again, it'll know your, when you go and log on to my profile, it'll tell you, hey, Charlie, you've got a license that might need this. Yeah. And so yeah, it'll alert you the minute you log on to my profile. Charlie, are you going to hunt migratory birds? If you are, you got to do this. What's it? What does it ask? So the first question is, do you plan to hunt migratory birds this year? That's a yes or no. You're, you're, you plan on hunting Virginia rails on the second, so your answer is yes. And then it will ask you, did you hunt migratory birds last year? If you say no, you are done. For the, that's it. That's all you got to do. If you said, yes, I hunted migratory birds last year, then it, a series of boxes will pop up and it'll say, did you hunt doves? You say yes or no. If you say yes, it'll ask you, how many doves did you shoot? Zero. 1 to 15, 15 to 30. And then it'll say rails and gal, you know, it'll give you a series of groupings and you say yes or no, I didn't hunt those and this is the ballpark number I shot. And one of the bits of confusion I get all the time from folks is, well, I didn't 
answer those numbers right. How can you possibly get an estimate of how many people are hunt, how many birds people are shooting? Because I said I shot, I was in the one to fifteen range. And, Will it come uh, out in the wash? Well, it, it, they don't use. We don't use those numbers. All those numbers do is classify you. Imagine Charlie Baglin is uh, dove hunted last year, and you said I shot fifteen to thirty. You went one day and or two days, and you shot in that fifteen to thirty range. So there's the thirty plus. Imagine a grouping the super hunter, and then Charlie is the moderate hunter, and then the zero is a casual hunter tried but didn't wasn't successful, and so you're lumped into one of these three groupings, and from those groupings, the service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, later will choose some number of each of those groups to survey more intensively. So next year you might get a survey say Charlie, you dove hunted, you're in this moderate group. We would like, if you don't mind, for you to keep this daily log of your dove hunts. And so every day you dove hunt, when you come in, you will fill out their little log. I hunted on the first. I shot seven doves. Uh, I hunted for three and a half hours. I hunted on the fifth. I shot nine doves, and I hunted for an hour and a half. And so you'll keep that highly detailed log, and it's that highly detailed log that will be used next year to estimate how many birds are shot, not these just big kind of broad classifications. Again, it's just those broad classifications. Those numbers aren't used other than to classify you, and that's how we sample within those numbers. At what point does this survey help to determine the population of the birds out there? It's all part of the biological information we use to manage these species. I mean, it's important for us to know how many birds are being harvested. Now, we get at that with banding. We get at that with the survey. And then we get at information like how many there are through, say, for waterfowl. We have, we spend, you know, a lot of money and a lot of time and effort to fly yeah. uh, surveys in the, in the Arctic area or sub-Arctic areas of Canada and, and Dakotas and places like that where we count ducks. And they put the planes in the air for weeks and weeks and weeks to count ducks. Some species we don't have as good a survey. Some uh, woodcock, we have a spring uh, survey that we count birds, the males that are singing across their breeding range. Not as good a survey. We rely more on banding data and on this harvest data for that model. Doves, we now we don't do any surveys for doves. We base estimate populations based off of banding. And we use that banding information to actually create population estimates from banding data. So we take these survey. I take my survey. And so I've answered all the questions, let's say 10 minutes tops, maybe? Uh, Five minutes tops. Five minutes. And then I click. At the completion of it, it'll give you a number. It'll pop up and say, Charlie, your 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 migratory bird number is this. And so you have two options. One, you can just take that number right then and write it anywhere you can fit it on your license so that you can see it. Or you have the option, once you could cl- close out of that, back on my profile, You right there it says, uh, sportsman's license, Charlie Baglin, reprint. And you can hit the reprint button okay. and right there on your computer, reprint it out, and now the number is printed officially on your license. Not everybody has Internet access. Absolutely. Not everybody has a printer. Right. What do you do in that case? Well, again, if you don't have a printer, you just write it with a pen on your license. Can this be done by phone? Yes, sir. You may call our 1-800 number, and somebody there will walk you through the process. Same deal, less than five minutes. So if you don't have Internet access, just call us and uh, between 8 and 5 or 8 and 4.30 each day, a business day, and somebody will walk you through the process. Thousands of tens of, tens of thousands of people who have already completed the survey, and we've submitted that data to the Fish and Wildlife Service for this coming season. So we still need more people to do it, and we're trying every way we can to get the word out. But uh, it certainly is a, it's, it's a, it's a really simple process. But this is a law. It's not an option. It is a federal law that requires that we ask these questions of you know, everybody. And it's easy stuff. Back with our final few with Kentucky's migratory game bird guru, John Brudges. I'm Charlie Baglin, and you're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. Back with our final.
down a few on Kentucky Field Radio. I'm Charlie Baglin. The Harvest Information Program is the topic. A federal mandate that you take this survey if you plan to hunt doves, geese, ducks, or other migratory game birds. We have an extremely high rate of people who participate because hunters are interested in the environment and they're interested in the resource and they want to help in most parts. And so people want to answer these questions and want to be involved and want to play a role in it's, it's important information. And once you kind of explain it to them, they're happy to participate. The biggest part of that is because the data was so bad, we were forced to be more conservative because if we don't know, that uncertainty causes us to be conservative. Yeah. And so if we have better quality data, there might be more opportunities for Kentucky sportsmen in the future. We don't have to be the canvas back, again, as an example, that we've jumped from zero to one to two to zero birds. A lot of that jump is not really population. It's the uncertainty created by this bad survey data. If we can improve this across the nation, then we potentially could get in a place where we don't lose that opportunity for Kentucky sportsmen. The acronym is HIP, H-I-P, Harvest Information Program. Let's talk about the seasons that are coming up this fall. September 1, dove, snow geese, white-fronted and brant goose, coot, mallard season, Canada goose, common moorhen, purple gallinule. Oh, can I stop you on that? Yeah. Common moorhen is no longer common moorhen. It's common gallinule. In Kentucky, we have common and purple gallinules. Not common. So we'll, the season coming up will be for those two species. Virginia, sora rail, wood ducks, and wood teal ducks. season. Let's talk about wood, du- wood, wood duck and teal season. This is a big, big point because it's a major change for this year. We've always started our wood duck and teal season or at least for quite some time, on the third Wednesday of September. This year, the commission has decided we will change the season from the third Wednesday initiation to the third Saturday in September. So we'll no longer start on Wednesday. The season will start on Saturday. And the reason behind that being with those additional teal days, we can now have two weekends of duck hunting in September. We have the start with the wood duck and teal on that third Saturday, and then the following weekend will be the last couple days of of the teal only season. You can hunt two weekends now in September versus one. Let's talk about youth hunts for waterfowl for kids. We have, uh, again, this year we have a weekend uh, at the beginning of the season in the eastern part of the state and a weekend for kids at the after the season in the western part of the state. And um, I'm str- I want to say it's like the 7th and 8th of November before the season starts and then the, the 3rd or 4th of February. I, I don't have the numbers right here in front of me. But, again, it's basically the weekend before, the weekend after seasons uh, for the kids. If you're a duck hunter, the season will be exactly the same as last year. We'll, have, again, have a liberal season with one change that we'll have two canvas backs this year versus one. On September 1st, opening day for Dove, Early Canada Goose, Crow, Virginia and Sora Rail, Moorhen, Gallinule, Canada Goose goes from uh, September 1st through mid September, that's the 15th, and then Thanksgiving, around Thanksgiving, is we'll, it right we'll open, through the end of January? Yeah, all the geese will open at Thanksgiving, with Thanksgiving Day and run through the end of January. Other dates, Virginia Sora Rail, first day of September through 11-9. So that would be till, till deer gun season. You want to go over real quickly baited fields? Baited fields are always an issue, especially this where you're coming up on dove season. People will ask me, Tom, Jay, you want to come hunt with us? I'm really careful about it because you want to make sure you know who you're hunting with and that you know, if somebody's poured bait out, even if you're, you don't know it and it's in that field, uh, you're, you're running the risk of getting in significant trouble. Define what bait is. It's uh, food poured out for wildlife that is not a normal practice. Uh, so if you've got a normal agricultural practice, this like you're, you know, where you're harvesting corn and there's some waste grain left yeah. on the ground. That's a normal agricultural practice. That's not bait. But if you go behind the the harvester and dump a couple hundred pounds of corn on the ground, that's not a normal ag- and that's baiting. So knowing that that's going to attract the wildlife you want to hunt. Right. And you don't have to be sitting right on the bait pile. You can be sitting somewhere that bait pile is influencing. An example, a friend, uh, one of the officer gave me that. 
from from the East Coast where people had this bait pile way up a river, and they were hunting on a point a couple miles up this river or creek that birds were coming to the bait, and that bait was drawing these birds in, and they knew that the birds would take this flight line, and so they used that bait. Even though they weren't sitting on it, they were hunting over bait. The bait was influencing their harvest, and so that was a case where you're hunting over bait. So you don't have to be right there to do it. But, now, Your Honor, I had no idea that bait was there. Well, that's yeah, that's that's an argument that, again, you have to, if you honestly have no idea that the bait was there, then in theory you are not liable. Uh, if your neighbor, you're, this is Charlie Baglin's property, and I'm hunting on Charlie Baglin's property, and you don't really know your neighbor or don't know what he does and he has a bait pile on the other side that you couldn't reasonably know was there, then you're not liable for that. But if if, if you're hunting in Charlie Baglin's property and there's a big bait pile on Charlie Baglin's property, it's assumed that you reasonably should know that that bait pile is there and that you shouldn't be hunting there. It's the reasonable man, the reasonable hunter standard. Right. Again, those of you that dove hunt, just be, be make sure that you know the people that you're hunting with and that, you, that they are on the up and up because you don't want to be standing there and have an officer show up and say, you're in a baited field. Uh, that's not a good place to be. It's one of the one of those unforgivable kind of sins. Baseball has gambling on baseball, kind yeah. of gets you banned for life. Hunting over bait is is the waterfowl, the migratory bird hunting equivalent of that. Very well, and you do pay attention when you drive. I try to. Do you notice I didn't say text and drive? I don't text and drive because there's a lot of things that can distract you. So I'm just saying. Eyes straight ahead, hands <laughs> ten and two. Absolutely. All right, man. John, thanks a million. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Okay, now to take the hip survey, go to this address on the web, fw.ky.gov, and click on the My Profile link. On the larger computer screen, you'll find that under the More tab. If you look for it on your telephone, it'll be right there at the top of the screen. You can take the hip survey right there. You can do it by phone by calling 800-858-1549. And that same number can put you in touch with Dr. John if you'd like to chat. Meanwhile, we are out of time. This is Charlie Bagman inviting you to join us in a week. And we'll go inside outdoors again right here on Kentucky Afield Radio. Thank you.